of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And in our last halaqa, we had mentioned the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the details that we know regarding that period of his life. We now move on to the period of his life, uh, that is his early childhood, that is him growing up as a young child. And the fact of the matter is that we have very, very little information with regards to these first 20, 30, even 40 years. And as I said uh, in the last halaqa, that if we were to gather together the entire 53 years of Mecca of the Prophet ﷺ, it would be less than half of the next 10 years that we have information of in Medina, right? And of these 53 years, of course, most of the information begins after the age of 40. So the first 40 years, the fact of the matter is we have limited number of incidents, very few. And I explained the reasons for this and that is because who is going to record? And who is going to pass that down? And who lived long enough? And how num numerous were the Sahaba? And how much persecution occurred? Right? So a lot of these factors combined. But one thing we believe as Muslims, and this is what we take consolation in, is that anything that we need to know, Allah must have preserved. This is of course a theological point, right? We cannot prove it scientifically. Anything that we needed to know about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we would uh, believe that Allah Azza wa Jal had recorded that. So, the first thing that we know of his life after his birth is the fact that his mother gave him to be raised in the desert. Now, this is something that is strange for many of us. Why would a mother give her newborn to be raised away from the house. In fact, this was a custom of the elite of the Quraysh. It was a custom of the nobility of the Quraysh. And they did this for a number of reasons. So this was a status symbol, if you like. It was something that they did as being a part of this tribe. Why did they do it? A number of reasons. First and foremost, they wanted the child to be raised in a pure and healthy environment. They wanted the ch child to be raised in a pure and healthy environment. And as you know, the infant mortality during this uh, phase of humanity, in fact, even up until 100 years ago, the infant mortality was extremely high. And so one of the ways they would protect the child is to actually take it away from congregations, from what we call civilization, such that there's only two or three people interacting with the child, i.e. one family, right? And as you know, Disease is carried by people, by, by people congregating together. So when you remove the child from this environment, you in fact increase the chances of its survival. So for the mercy of the child and to increase the chance of the child living, then they would send him away from the city. Also, uh, of course, so they wanted to remove the plagues and the disease of the desert, uh, of the city. Also, they wanted to build stamina in the child. Stamina in the child and make them adjusted to a rough life. Now even though from our standards life in Mecca was unbelievably tough, right? But for the people of Mecca they're used to it. And so they want to raise their child in an even more austere environment so that they then become accustomed to the hardships of Mecca. Because children adapt to their circumstances much easier than adults. And that is why a child who is born in a very uh, impoverished scenario or situation, or in a very congregated or congested area, the child is content and happy. Right? Just as happy as the child born in a rich and luxurious family. Allah has made us in a beautiful way. The child knows how to have fun regardless of the circumstance. Right? Unlike an adult, now we're used to a standard. And if we were to, la qaddar Allah, be diminished in that standard, life would become almost impossible to bear. Even though many other people in the world would love the standard that uh, we have been diminished to, let's say. Right? So it is human nature that children adapt to their circumstance. And this shows us that the Quraysh had long-term planning, they had vision. That the child is raised in a difficult environment such that the hardships of Mecca appear like luxury. The hardships of Mecca then appear like luxury. Another uh, reason that some of the people have mentioned is that Growing up in uh, the desert away from the family will avoid the pampering that other relatives do. We all know that uh, grandparents spoil the child, let's say, right? It's a rule of thumb. Grandparents spoil the child. In fact, some people say that's why Allah created grandparents. Parents are strict, grandparents are lenient. That's supposed to be the case. So, not just grandparents, uncles, aunts, extended family, they all ruin 
And of course, every parent knows that no matter how strict of the laws that you have for the children, when they go to their uncles, aunts, when they go to their grandparents, what happens? All those laws go out the window. So once again, to raise the child in a disciplined environment, right? They would be handed over to a particular family. And the final reason that the scholars of history mention for this rather strange custom from our perspective, but from them they were accustomed to it, the final reason that they mention is that the child being raised in the desert amongst certain tribes. Now realize, not every tribe would go into Mecca and, and ask for, for children. These are certain tribes that are known for this, uh, for this fact. These tribes were known for their fluency in Arabic. Now the Arabs viewed the language of the cities as being corrupted. The Arabs viewed the city language as being the, uh, changed. Why? Because what happens to any language, it gets influenced by other cultures. Any language gets word loans from other cultures, right? So for example, if you read a modern Arabic newspaper in our times, 30 to 40 percent of the words are English. Just Arabicized. And as for Pakistan, I would say 70% is English of the modern newspapers, right? That's my problem, I can't understand because I don't know. I think it's an Urdu word, it's actually an English word. Right, limited company edition, the whole thing is English. I'm trying to read, what is this? You know, in Urdu, I don't understand, it's not, you know, coming in my head. The point being, where does this occur? Not in the desert, not amongst the villagers, amongst, amongst the city dwellers, right? So, the Arabs of the Quraysh, again, they're thinking long term. They don't want the, the traders from Yemen, from, from all over the country to come and corrupt their Qurayshi dialect. So what do they do? They send them to the pure areas, the tribes that were known for their fluency of the Arabic, to be uncorrupted, to be speaking the original ancient Arabic. And the most famous tribe that was known for this, uh, the, 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 the saving of, let's say, the pure Arabic, is the Banu Bakr ibn Sa'd. The Banu, uh, Sa sorry, the Banu Sa'd ibn Bakr. The Banu Sa'd ibn Bakr. And of course, it was this tribe that adopted uh, or that took care of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In one authentic hadith, the Prophet was asked, Tell us about yourself. Tell us something about your childhood, about yourself. So the Prophet said, Ana da'watu Abi Ibrahim. Wa bushra akhi Isa. وَاسْتَرْضَعْتُ فِي بَنِي سَعَدْ إِبْنِ بَكْرِ I am the da'wah of my father Ibrahim. Ibrahim made a dua, I am that dua manifested. You all know the dua, رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْرُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ الْكِتَابُ الْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ So Ibrahim made a dua when he's building the first house of worship. And as he's putting the stones in place, and he's praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes a dua, O oh Allah, send a, a, a mighty prophet from amongst my progeny, who will recite to them your verse, purify them, and teach them the book and wisdom. So he said, "Ana da'wa tu Abi Ibrahim." I am that da'wa. I am that du'a responded. Wa bush wa ana bushra, and I am the glad news. Now, some people have interpreted this to mean the gospel, because what does gospel mean? It's good news. And the, the Christians, they misunderstood the whole point, according to one theory of Islam, that when Jesus is saying that, uh, you know, I'm coming to preach the gospel or the good news, well, the good news here is in fact, Bushra Akhi Isa, right? Because good news and gospel is the same in, in Greek. That's what it means, that the gospel is the good news. That's how they translated it. So some Muslim theologians, uh, and it seems to be a, f a plausible theory, some Muslim theologians say that these references in the New Testament, that I, I have to send uh, the good news and I'm gonna, I've come with the good news. This good news is not the gospel as they understood it. The good news is as Allah says in the Quran, and as the Prophet ﷺ says, that Rasulim min ba'di ismuhu Ahmad. There's going to be a prophet after me. His name is Ahmad. So he's saying, Ana Bushra Isa. Akhi Isa. I am the good news that my brother Isa predicted. And then he said, Wastardatu. And I was uh, foster cared. Rada'a means to be foster cared. Foster care means to be uh, suckled by another woman than your mother. So I was foster cared by the Bani Sa'ad ibn Bakr. And the Bani Sa'ad ibn Bakr was the most uh, famous tribe known for taking care of the children of the Quraysh, known for speaking the proper Arabic. Now you all know the story of Halima, we're just going to summarize it briefly. Uh, Halima bint Sa'diya, the famous uh, uh, foster mother of the Prophet ﷺ, she narrates the story in the first person. And it is recorded in a number of books of hadith and of seerah. And so inshallah it is an authentic hadith, no doubt about that. That she said that uh, she and her husband were suffering greatly from poverty. And this was of course, now why would they take care of a child? They wanted money, obviously. They are 
uh, villagers, not even villagers, they are people living in the Bedouin, they are desert dwellers, right? And of course, as you know, desert dwellers, they don't get much income. Life is very tough. So one of the reasons why they would walk into Mecca and adopt children from the rich people of the Quraysh, this was a custom only for the rich and elite. It was not a custom for all of the people of Mecca. Only the noblemen, and as we know, Abdul Muttalib is the chieftain, so his children and grandchildren, they must have this custom. This is a custom for the noblemen and the elite. And of course, by the way, in our times, uh, the rich, they have nannies. The rich, they have governesses, right? This is the custom of our times. In those days, this was the rich, they would send their children to uh, the desert. So, Halima narrates that we were suffering greatly from poverty. So, she's explaining, why would she want to take another baby? Because that baby gets money. The, the parents give money. And so, I convinced my husband to go with the uh, yearly, there was a yearly time that the uh, women of uh, Banu, Sa Banu Sa'id ibn Bakr uh, would go to Mecca and would obtain any newly uh, born child who would be willing to be adopted, not adopted, but foster fed for two, three years. So there was an annual event. Everybody knew this was the period. For one week, they're going to come and they're going to uh, find out who has given birth and they're going to go knocking on their door and the mother of the child will choose which of them seems to be the one that I like the most. Just like we do in our times, you choose the nanny, the governess. So the mothers would choose the best one. So Halima says that, uh, she had just had a newborn. Now, of course, you have to have a newborn to take care of another because you're going to breastfeed. So she just had a child and they're suffering from poverty. And by the way, she had an older daughter as well. So when the process was taken in, there were two children of Halima. There was an older daughter, probably around seven, eight years old, we can estimate. Her name was Shayma. Her name was Shayma. And so she is the foster sister of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and she had a newborn son. I could not find the name of this son in the five or six books that I looked up of the early period of Islam. Allah knows, maybe we'll find him in other books, but I could not find him in uh, those original books. Uh, so she had a newborn son, and she had an older daughter, Shayma. This newborn son, of course, is what caused her milk to flow, and so she is able to uh, foster care another child. So she goes with her group of. Uh, newly mothers, because they're all new brothers. You have to be a new mother to take another child on. Uh, and so she goes with the group, probably five, ten women uh, from her clan, and they enter into Mecca, and they find out who has given birth. And they hear of the newest batch that has come forth in the last uh, five or six or seven months. One of them, of course, is the child that was called the orphan child. They were told immediately, there's an orphan child. His father's already dead. Some of the women didn't even go visit the house of Amina, because... The only reason you'd adopt the child is because you want money. And when the child is an orphan, then it's known that you're not going to get that much money. After all, I mean, where is he going to get money from? Abdul Muttalib, no doubt he's the chieftain, but he has, you know, ten sons and, and, and five daughters, and of those, so many grandchildren. Who's going to give a, a, a large sum uh, of money for an orphan? So some women didn't even go to the house of Amina. Others went, and when they saw how poor and the poverty, they, they didn't uh, like the, taking uh, a child who was an orphan. Halima as well visited, and she tried to move on to find another child because she wanted the money. When the week finished, every one of her friends had acquired one of these newborn children, except for Halima. And the only child remaining was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she told her husband that I feel embarrassed. It's, it's like a bit shameful that all of my friends are going back now to uh, the desert and they have a child and I don't have any. It seems like it's, I'm lost. I mean, it's not fair, meaning I want to be like them. So her husband said, why don't you take the orphan child? Perhaps Allah will bless us through him. Notice there's good in his heart. Perhaps Allah will, maybe he's not going to bring that much money, but perhaps Allah will bless us. And this shows the couple were a good-hearted couple. They had good manners, they were, they were thinking religiously as well, even though at this time they're pagan, but they realized taking care of an orphan is a noble thing. So her husband said, why don't you adopt, why don't you take care of the foster child that's an orphan, perhaps Allah will bless us through him. And so they agreed to take care of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All the narrations say that as soon as they took the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the miracles began right then and there, that uh, the, uh, she only had one 
old goat that had stopped giving milk for a long time. As soon as the Prophet ﷺ entered into the tent, the goat's udders became full. Uh, she had an old uh, uh, mount that they were riding the both of them. And when they put the Prophet ﷺ along with the family on this ride, on this animal, it became the fastest animal. All of these are mentioned. And of course, this is no problem at all. Allah Azza wa Jal blesses uh, whoever He chooses. And it is expected that these things would have occurred uh, to those who took care of the Prophet ﷺ. Generally speaking, this, this foster care usually lasted two years. The custom was to take care of the child for a year and a half to two years, right? So you don't come back the next season, uh, you come back to visit. You come back to show the child the next season, and the child stays with the mother a month or two, and then given back to the, the foster care. So after two years, when the time has come, uh, and in the middle, Allah knows how many times uh, she came back to show the child, no doubt they must have arranged something, we don't have any details. But it's not as if there's no touch at all, there's no contact at all. Every few months, every whatnot, there must have been some type of returning, and Amina would have met her son, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. During these two years, the blessings that Halima witnessed in her household were so many that she was scared of losing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so she invented a million and one excuses in front of Amina. That the child is still young and I don't want to send him back to uh, the, the, the city and is going to be problematic and there's diseases and plagues and we'll take care of him. And she kept on persisting, persisting, persisting until Amina felt that there was so much care and love that, uh, that the Prophet is in good hands. And so she agreed to extend this contract for a longer period, even though for sure she could not have given the amount of money that her Halima's other uh, friends would be getting, but it is not money, it was the blessings that came with the taking care of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, it was during the second phase of this foster care that the famous incident of Shaq al-Sadr, of opening up of the heart occurred. And this is an incident that we have no doubt about because the Quran references, because there are authentic ahadith about it, because the Sahaba saw the line on the chest of the Prophet ﷺ that showed that it had been opened up. So this is clearly something that we believe in. When the Prophet ﷺ was four years old, Anas ibn Malik narrates, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, so there's an authentic hadith, no question about it, that Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ when he was playing with the other children. When, when Jibreel came, the other children ran away, they're scared. The Prophet ﷺ stood his ground. As a four-year-old kid, he's displaying bravery. He stood his ground. What do you want from me? And Jibreel came and overpowered him. Sara'ahu. This means that he was struggling. Four-year-old kid is fighting an angel. The strongest angel Allah has created. But he's not going to go without a fight. Again, this shows the determination of the Prophet Muhammad So Jibreel forced him on the ground. You can't fight Jibreel. He forced him on the ground and he opened up his chest. Shaqqa sadrahu. It's just two words. Opened up his chest. How, what, all of this Allah knows. Jibreel does not need instruments to do what Allah wants him to do. He opened up his chest and he took his heart out. And he took out a black slither, a black portion from the heart. And he threw it away. And he said, هَذَا حَظُّ الشَّيْطَانِ مِنْكَ This is shaitan's portion that he had in you. Pause here for a sec before I continue the hadith. Every child that is born, shaitan pricks him as soon as it is born. According to our Prophet ﷺ, and I believe him completely because I'm a Muslim, our Prophet ﷺ said that is why babies cry when they come out of the womb. Because the child pricks him out of, um, the shaitan pricks him out of jealousy, out of hatred, out of anger. Shaitan wants to harm the child as soon as it comes out of the womb. Literally, as soon as it comes out, this is the hatred and animosity of shaitan. Because Allah preferred Adam and the children of Adam over him, so shaitan has become our enemy even from the cradle up until the grave. So as soon as the child is born, shaitan pricks him, prods him, and some type of element, Allah knows how and what, but this hadith demonstrates, some type of element is put into the child. Allah creates the child pure. Shaitan attempts to corrupt it from, literally not day one, minute one. Shaitan begins the corruption process right from the beginning. And there's something then, Allah knows, we're never going to do this, is ilm al-ghayb, that has some type of connection, some type of contact. This is perhaps how shaitan whispers into us. This is how, now remember, shaitan does not ever control us. 
Shaitan doesn't have a control panel like a, uh, these games you girls, you guys and girls play Wii and all that, just press buttons. No, no, Shaitan cannot do that. No. Nobody can blame Shaitan. Allah, Shaitan forced me. No. Shaitan does not force. Allah says in the Quran on the day of judgment, when mankind will say to Shaitan, why did you do this to us? Shaitan will respond, مَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ Sultan. I didn't have powers over you. I didn't control you. Illa, except one thing. أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي I called you and you guys responded. That was the control I had. I seduced and enticed you, you guys responded. فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't come and blame me. This conversation is in the Quran. Don't come and blame me, go blame yourselves. I didn't have any power over you. So, what, what this type of relationship is, Allah knows best, but it appears that this allows the shaitan access to whisper into our thoughts. That's really all that it is. That we get these bad thoughts not coming from us. And by the way, when you get a very evil thought, a blasphemous thought, no, this is from shaitan. It's not from you. It's not from your heart of iman. This is from shaitan. Something really vulgar, vile, bad comes in. You get a desire to do something and you're wondering, where did that come from? You know, the answer is from shaitan. And your job is to fight it. Because it's just a whisper. It's not a control. So, that relationship was cut off at the age of four. And this is proven by another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, that every child that is born, shaitan assigns, shaitan meaning iblis, the big shaitan, assigns a qareen to that person. Every one of us has a qareen, right now, right here. Maybe not in the masjid, inshaAllah, they're outside. But all of us have a qareen. They are with us 24-7. They know us better than our mothers and our spouses and our children because they're with us. What is the job of the qareen? Just to whisper bad things, that's it. Now look at the hatred that shaitan and his cohorts have for us. Wallahi, they spend their whole lives just trying to misguide us. That, why? Jealousy and hate, hatred and anger. Why did Allah choose you over us? We should have been chosen. This jealousy and hatred, shaitan assigns a qareen to every one of us. We all have our qareens. And the purpose of the qareen is to whisper these evil thoughts. So the sahaba said, even you ya Rasulullah, you have a qareen? He said, even I have a qareen. Except that Allah helped me against him, and now he's accepted Islam, and he only whispers good things to me. So, the Prophet's qareen whispers good things. And this hadith, again, it relates to this point. That whatever relationship shaitan might have had, is completely gone. There is no other uh, more relationship because Jibreel took it out. هَذَا حَظُّ الشَّيْطَانِ مِنْ He took it out. And then, he washed the heart in a golden cup of zamzam. And then he put it back. So he washed the heart and he put it back and he sealed it up. He put his hand like this, and the heart sealed up. So we believe the first open heart surgery was performed by Jibreel upon the Prophet Muhammad wasallam because it is a physical taking out of the heart. It is not just a spiritual thing. It is a physical taking out of the heart. So when the children, uh, the, 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 the foster brother and Shayma, who he was playing with, uh, when the children ran away, they ran back and they said, and they're looking in the distance that there's a man throwing him on the floor, putting blood in and this and that. So they come screaming and running that our brother has died, our brother has been killed, a man has abducted him, a man has killed him. And of course, Harima and others, they became so worried, they come running outside and they found the Prophet ﷺ sitting, his face is pale. SubhanAllah, not wailing, not screaming, not crying, he's the brave for you. He was the bravest four-year-old the world has ever seen. He's pale, he's suffered something, but he's controlling the crying and the wailing. He's sitting there, you can t sense the fear, the, the terror, but he's not wailing and screaming. And when they uh, saw him, they saw those lines on his chest, and Anas ibn Malik says, I could see the traces of that line on his chest. Anas is narrating this hadith when the Prophet is around 60 years old. And he's saying, I could see the traces on that chest. Now if Allah had willed, it could have been a clean cut. Allah doesn't need to leave a line. You understand what I'm saying here? Allah doesn't need to leave a scar. Because Allah heals and complete. But Allah wants to demonstrate that something physical happened. And there is a physical line 
Like you have in a scar that Anas ibn Malik saw, that I saw, I could see that line in the chest of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the end of the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Now, this incident of taking the heart out and washing it occurred one more time, almost 45 years later. When the Prophet ﷺ went up to the journey of Al-Isra and Mi'raj, we're going to come back to that, Allah knows when, but we're going to come back to that, and we're going to mention again that Jibreel did the exact same thing. That he opened up the chest of the Prophet ﷺ before taking him on the journey. And he washed it in Zamzam water, and he put it back, but there's one difference. There was no black cloth the second time. There was no black cloth the second time, because the black cloth has already been gotten rid of, when the Prophet ﷺ is four years old. This incident was what concerned Halima. And she decided before anything else happens, let me quietly return the Prophet ﷺ to Amina. Because she doesn't know what's happening. Strange things now. She knows there's something about this child. Now this incident happens and she gets worried. And so she quietly returns the Prophet ﷺ to Amina. And that was when he was returned to the care of his mother Amina. Of course, the, the, the spiritual benefits that we derive from this particular incident is that the Prophet is being prepared for a pure and clean life. The Prophet is being prepared to live the most respectable, the most dignified, the most pure life that man has ever known. And that is because it is the Sunnah of Allah that all the Prophets have the perfect characters. It is the Sunnah of Allah that the characters of the Prophets are impeccable, that they cannot commit major sins. In Arabic we call it ma'asum or isma. The Prophet ﷺ, all, or all the Prophet, not even our, just our Prophet ﷺ, all the Prophets are ma'asum. Ma'asum from what? From major sins. They can commit minor infractions, they can get angry like Musa did, they can uh, do hasty things like Yunus did. All of these things are human uh, minor issues. But they cannot commit a major sin. They cannot commit any major sin. And by removing this, so the Prophet ﷺ was therefore raised in this uh, pure environment. Even though it was a spiritual cleansing, it was physically done. It's a spiritual cleansing of the heart, but it was physically done and it was revealed in the Quran. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. And uh, pretty much all the scholars of tafsir have said that this is a reference to opening up. Alam nashrah laka sadrak. Haven't we opened up your chest? Right? And we gave, uh, explained a number of weeks ago in the khutbah, I gave that there's a number of interpretations. One of them is that, and this is the majority interpretation, is that this is a reference to the cleansing of the heart. The other interpretation does not contradict it, and that is Allah is saying, Alam nashrah laka sadrak, i.e. by guiding you to Islam. Because Islam is also sharah al-sadr. Islam is called the opening up of the heart. So being guided to Islam makes your heart open to Allah's wisdom. It is narrated many, many, many years later, 50 years, more than 50, 54 years later roughly, during the battle of Hunayn, which is one of the last battles that the Prophet ﷺ ever fought. This is after the conquest of Mecca. When, when all of the tribes are entering into Islam, that the tribe of Banu Sa'id ibn Bakr was also fought and conquered. And the tribe of Banu Sa'id ibn Bakr is the tribe of Halima. And so as the Prophet ﷺ is walking, one of the women who was conquered, who was the, 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 all of the prisoners, she stands up and, or, or excuse me, no, she is brought to the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, she stands up and makes a commotion, but the Prophet ﷺ doesn't see. And she claims to be the sister of the Prophet ﷺ. Now you have a prisoner who's claiming to be the sister of the Prophet ﷺ. The Sahaba didn't know what to do. So they brought her to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, Ya Rasulullah, this lady is claiming to be your sister. So the Prophet ﷺ said, how do I know? I mean, he knows who the sister is referenced. That's Shayma. How do I know that's you? Because everybody knows that Halima is from this tribe. Now a woman stands up and says, I am the daughter. Give me a sign. How do I know that this is you? So she said, I still have the marks of the bite that you bit me when I was carrying you as a baby on my back. <laughs> I still have that. So the Prophet realized that this is Shayma. Now she says a story that nobody would know. Right? So he says, this is Shema, and so she free, he freed Shema, and he gave her many, many presents. 
It appears that Halima and her husband were not in this uh, uh, present or were not at this uh, occasion when they, they were conquered. Later on, they came to visit. After this battle had occurred, they came to visit. And so Halima and her husband visited the Prophet wasallam when he was in his uh, late 50s. And when, when he saw Halima, he recognized her instantly because this is, of course, Halima would not have changed that much. Shayma, of course, is six years old. By the time he sees her again, this is, you cannot recognize. But Halima was an adult. So he, when he saw Halima, he stood up to greet her. This is his mother, his foster mahram. He stood up to greet her. He took off his own shawl, his own rida, and he placed it on the ground for her to sit on. And uh, in some narrations, her husband was with her. In some narrations, it only mentions uh, uh, that uh, Halima was there. And it is said uh, in some of the books that she accepted Islam. And the Prophet gifted her uh, immensely. And they went their way. Nonetheless, getting back to the story where we are now. So shortly after the Prophet was returned to Amina, we only have one incident that is recorded during this time. There's only one incident. I have looked as much as I could in all of the, 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 the ancient and the classical works, and there's only one authentic incident that we know. So subhanAllah, what else did Amina do, and what were the moments, and what was her tarbiyah? We don't know anything. There's only one thing that has been narrated that you all know, and that is that Amina decided to take her son to Yathrib. Now, let's pause here. Remember three four halaqahs ago, we mentioned that the Prophet's great-grandmother was from Yathrib, right? Now, surely you see the wisdom in Allah's divine plan. That out of all the cities, I mean all of his other grandmothers, grandmothers are Qurashi, they're all from Mecca. And it just so happens that Abdul Muttalib's mother, Abdul Muttalib's father falls in love with a little girl or a girl from Yathrib. Out of all the travels, surely you see Allah has a divine wisdom plan. That there should have been a connection, and there was a connection, between the Prophet ﷺ and Yathrib before the immigration. Out of all the cities, the only city he traveled to as a little child, and the only city that he has other relatives in, in the entire surrounding areas, is but one small village of Yathrib, which was to be called Medina. Coincidence? Of course not. Allah has a plan. Allah has a plan. And so, and it was of course the custom of the Arabs, that they preserved their lineage completely. And they were proud of their lineage, as you know. And they knew exactly who was who for not just 10 generations, all the way back to, they say Ibrahim or Adnan, they would preserve their generations. They would know who is who. And they would keep the ties of kinship. Why? Because this was Jahili society. You are protected by your relatives. Your prestige is established by your relatives. Everything, there is no government, there is no law, there is no order. Your relatives dictate your protection wherever you go. And of course, no doubt, when you're friends, when you have a, a relationship with people, then th this helps establish the ties. And so, Amina decided to take this little boy to Yathrib. And she had with her the one servant that it is said that Abdul Muttalib gifted them when they got married. And this is Ummi Ayman. Abdul Muttalib gifted his son uh, when they got married, Ummi Ayman. And Ummi Ayman, unfortunately, there's so little known about her. And it is uh, uh, sad because Ummi Ayman did live a long time. And she became a Muslim. And she even lived af until after the death of the Prophet wasallam. And if only somebody had sat down with her and recorded stories, then we would have had a whole chronicle. But Allah has His wisdom that we don't understand and, and, and know. And Ummi Ayman did indeed witness all of this. And she lived all the way till the Khilafah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. She lived until that time. But unfortunately, we don't have uh, much stories. This is one of those stories that she's telling. So a lot of these stories, they come from Ummi Ayman, because she's the only witness, right? So Ummi Ayman is the one telling us this story of, of what happened. So, Amina traveled to uh, Yathrib, which is now called Medina, along with Ummi Ayman, and the little boy, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. She was around six years old at the time. And as you all know, uh, she, they stayed there probably a few months. Again, we don't have dates, but when you travel that distance, you don't just stay two, three days. You stay two, three months. You get to know the, the, the tribe and the family. And some books of Sirah do mention that the Prophet ﷺ recognized some of the buildings of Medina when he, when he re returned uh, 50 years later. That he recognized some of the places that he was as a child in the city of Yathrib. And the Prophet ﷺ stayed there for a few months. 
on the way back in a small little settlement, which is still uh, present to this day, and it is called Al-Abwa. Al-Abwa. Uh, Amina herself fell ill, and she passed away right then and there, and Umm Ayman had her buried by the people of the village, Abwa, and so to this day her grave is at a place called Abwa. And it is reported in Sahih Muslim that on one journey when the Prophet was returning home with the Sahaba, and the path to Mecca, sorry, the path to Medina is straight ahead, he simply diverted away from the path. He turned away from the path and started walking basically into the wilderness, away from the road. They did have roads, not like our roads, but they had landmarks. They know this is the road. He turns away from the road and he walks away. All the Sahaba silently just walk with him, not even asking a question. Whatever the Prophet does, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا They're just walking with him. And the Sahaba who are narrating this, they say that the Prophet ﷺ found a grave over there and he sat down and he cried like we had never seen him cry before. Until his lihya, his beard, which is, mashallah, it is narrated, the Prophet had a very big beard. His beard was wet with tears. And many of the Sahaba had never seen him cry before. This is the, for many of them, is the only time that they have seen him cry. And it is narrated that we, he only cried publicly a number of times uh, uh, when, when his son Ibrahim died. Uh, they saw him crying. And this was the, t- the time when they saw it so much so that his beard sallallahu alayhi wa became wet. And subhanAllah, the Sahaba did not ask one question. They didn't open their mouths. But when they saw the Prophet ﷺ crying, the whole congregation is crying with him. This is the love that they have. They don't even know what's happening. But they're just crying with him. And they're waiting for him to explain what is happening. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, I had used to forbid you from visiting graves. Pause here. Initially in early Islam, the ruling had been it is not allowed to visit graves except if you're burying the dead. You only enter the graveyard with a dead body. And then you leave and that's it. I used to forbid you from visiting graves. But I asked Allah to visit my mother's grave. Now he's explaining. I asked Allah permission to visit my mother's grave. Pause here again. The Prophet does not take one step without Allah's permission. He even wants to get permission to go visit his mother. This is why he is Rasulullah. That's why, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ That is why he is a role model. That he cannot lift a finger, except if Allah has allowed him to do so. So he's, he's telling the Sahaba, I used to forbid you from doing so. I asked Allah permission to visit my mother's grave, and he allowed me to visit her grave. So now I am allowing you. Therefore, the permissibility to visit graves is from Amina i.e. when the Prophet visited Amina. The permissibility that we still have in our Sharia to visit graves, it is from the Prophet wanting to visit his mother's grave, Amina. And so he said, and so he told us to visit graves because it reminds you of death. And the fact that the Prophet obviously is crying in this manner, I mean we don't need to mention this is his mother. He must have memories, not maybe that many. He was six years old when she passed away. But nonetheless, this was his mother. And he is crying in this fashion that the Sahaba have never seen him cry. And the Sahaba themselves are following the Sunnah and just crying with him. Because he is crying, so they cry as well. Really, it doesn't need to be mentioned, the love that he must have felt and the pain that he must have endured at the death of Amina. And as I have said, I have searched in all of the classical works that I have about more stories from Amina, but unfortunately I could not find anything that is really uh, of even a semi-authentic nature. And as I said, the reason for this is obvious and understood. Who is going to record in the privacy of Amina's household what she did with the Prophet the playful times, the joy, the laughing, the tear? Who's going to record all of this for us? And so this is something that we really don't have uh, much information about. So the Prophet's father passes away when his mother is pregnant with him. And his mother barely has two and a half years really to take care of him and nourish him because he was being taken care of by Halima as well. And then when the Prophet is barely six years old, he loses his mother and his father. So he is then entrusted to Abdul Muttalib, the chieftain of the Quraysh. And 
Once again, we really have hardly anything about Abdul Muttalib's relationship with the Prophet ﷺ other than one or two tidbits that we have in Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Sa'ad and other classical books. And of what Ibn Ishaq mentions about this period, uh, and he mentions it from some of the Tabi'un, so we can say, okay, the Tabi'un uh, must have heard it from their fathers and grandfathers. So inshallah, it's uh, permissible to narrate these types of stories. It is said that Abdul Muttalib uh, would have a raised platform in front of and connected to the Kaaba, because he's the chieftain of the Quraysh. We already talked about what happened when Abdul Muttalib was a youngster, was a young man, and how he was raised to this level and why the people respected him. We already mentioned this. We already said Abdul Muttalib lived a very long life, over 80. So now he's already over 80, he's already blind. Yeah, Abdul Muttalib died a blind man, he, he lived a very long age. So he had a raised platform that was connected to the Kaaba, and around Asr time when the shade would come, this platform was in that shade of the Kaaba. And he would sit there and discuss the affairs of the Quraysh, and the Quraysh would come, and he's the chieftain, so this is where, this is the public uh, platform. This is where he would sit every single afternoon. And of course, this is the platform that is the equivalent of the king's throne. Nobody sits on it. None of his sons, none of his grandsons. This is for Abdul Muttalib. And the one thing that we have recorded, that once the Prophet Sallallahu as a young boy came running and he jumped onto the platform to be next to Abdul Muttalib. His uncles, as Zubair and others, pulled him back down. Because this is, you're not supposed to go there. And Abdul Muttalib stopped him. He said, leave him. This is my child and he can remain on this platform. So out of all of the grandchildren, the only one that he allowed to be on that platform was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's one more incident that is narrated. These are the only two that we have from Abdul Muttalib. And that is that in one occasion, the uncles of the Prophet ﷺ sent the Prophet ﷺ to find some lost camels. And the reason why they did this, according to Ibn Sa'ad, he says, Ibn Sa'ad, by the way, is uh, these are the two earliest references of the seerah, Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Sa'ad. So I'm going to say these names throughout, so you should be aware of them. Ibn Ishaq, you all know, Ibn Sa'ad wrote a book called Tabaqat. Ibn Sa'ad died around 230 Hijrah. So he's also very early, and one of the earliest books as well of uh, seerah. So Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Sa'ad, con the, both of them consider, are considered to be the most ancient sources of the seerah that we still have in our times. Ibn Sa'id mentions the reason why his uncles chose a little kid, who was probably seven, eight years old, to go find the camels was because, listen to this, he never did anything except that it was successful. He was never assigned a task except that it was a successful endeavor that he did. So now the uncles are getting desperate. Camels are expensive creatures. The uncles are getting desperate and they can't find the camels. So they decide, well, this boy, whatever he does, it works. Let's go send him out alone in the desert to find the camels. And when they sent the Prophet ﷺ, he was delayed in coming back. And Abdul Muttalib, when he found out, he was furious at them. How could you have done this? Why did you send the boy? Now, of course, they sent him because they want the camels back, right? Abdul Muttalib was furious and he was pacing and walking around waiting for the Prophet to come. And as soon as he came, he hugged him and he said, from now on, I will never let you out of my sight. And this shows us that he had a special care and a concern for our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we all know, at the age of eight, once again, for the third time, our Prophet became an orphan. First his father, then his mother, and now his grandfather. One after the other, he became an orphan. Ibn Sa'ad mentions a narration, slight weakness in the chain, but no problem in narrating it, that one of the Sahabi said, Do you remember Abdul Muttalib, Ya Rasulullah? Remember, Abdul Muttalib was the legend. Remember this, Abdul Muttalib was the big guy. Before the coming of the Prophet he is the legend of Arabia. So they're curious, do you remember Abdul Muttalib, Ya Rasulullah? So he said, yes, I remember him. And I was eight years old when he died. So this hadith, clearly shows, even though it's slightly weak, but it clearly shows the age of the Prophet ﷺ, that he was eight years old when, the, when Abdul Muttalib passed away. And one of the things that Abdul Muttalib did on his deathbed is that he entrusted the Prophet ﷺ to his son Abu Talib. And the reason, of course, as we mentioned before, the only full brother that was still alive of Abdullah was Abu Talib. Abu Abdul Muttalib had married five wives, one after the other. Uh, he had married five wives, and from one of them, he had uh, a number of daughters and two sons that were still alive at this time, and that is, uh, of course, Abdullah had passed away, and then Abu Talib. So the full brother of Abdullah was Abu Talib, unlike 
uh, Abu Lahab, unlike Hamza, all of these were not full brothers, they were half uncles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Abu Talib takes charge of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Abu Talib lives a long life, and Abu Talib passes away when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is over 50 years old. So he remains with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we're going to be talking quite a lot about him in the future uh, uh, halaqat, insha'Allah ta'ala. Question. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put so much trials and tribulations on the young child? Why did Allah azza wa jal put three orphan situations, three traumatic trials, one after the other, upon our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I mean, if Allah had willed, he would have been born in the lap of luxury. If Allah had willed, he could have had loving parents until he became uh, a prophet, or at least, at least until he became a young man and an adult. He can stand on his feet. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will such a difficult childhood? The response, as our scholars mentioned, is that there's many reasons for doing so. First and foremost, like Allah says about Musa alayhi salam in the Quran, li nafsi. I was the one who took care of you. When everyone else had, was being killed in the Bani Israel, right? Even your mother was forced to abandon you. I was the one who took care of you. وَاصْطَنَعْتُكَ لِنَفْسِي لِتُصْنَعَ عَلَىٰ عَيْنِي So that you may be raised under my care. عَلَىٰ عَيْنِي here means under the care of Allah Azza wa Jalla, under my protection. And if this is what Allah says of Musa, then even more so for our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That no one can say that he has a favor over the Prophet sallallahu for having done anything. Allah azza wa jal took care of our Prophet sallallahu and took this responsibility directly. Another wisdom is that no doubt it is tough and it is difficult and it is in some sense traumatic to be an orphan. Yet at the same time, being an orphan gives you many qualities that the Prophet would need later on in his life. Being pampered and growing up in luxury is not going to prepare you for a life of sacrifice, for a mission of calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, not at all. But being born in a harsh environment, not having your mother and father to love you. As we all know as parents, no one on earth can love you like your mother and father. No one. And when our Prophet is deprived of a mother and father, Automatically, this makes the child more independent. It makes the child more mature, gives him wisdom. And this, these are qualities that the Prophet would need. And this is something we notice in every orphan child, that this orphan child is much more mature than his or her peers. And subhanAllah, even another thing notice, that a child born in poverty is more mature than a child born in luxury. Look, look around you. A child born in difficult circumstances, right? And subhanAllah, not to be stereotypical, but look at our own kids here in America versus kids in third world countries and the responsibilities placed on them and the maturity that they have at five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? This is something, reality. My own kids are guilt, just as guilty as yours, so no, no need to point to anybody. We're all, we're all in the same boat here, okay? We're all in the same boat here. SubhanAllah, you go quote unquote back home and six year old children are taking care of babies. Completely, mother has to go. The mother has to work. The six-year-old is taking care. Here in this country, I wouldn't give a sixteen-year-old care of a baby. Isn't this true, right? But this is what happens, and this is something we notice in our lives. Imagine in the time of the Prophet there is a divine wisdom. Nothing happens except that Allah has a plan behind it. So by putting the Prophet through such difficult circumstances, this made him who he was. And he needed to be that man in order to be the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, going through these difficult times makes you understand and experience firsthand poverty ruthlessness, living in a harsh environment. And generally speaking, this makes you more sensitive rather than more selfish. It is the rich who are selfish, not the poor. Everyone knows this. It is the rich who are stingy, not the poor. Well, look again, isn't this true? The more you have, the more stingy you become. And the less you have, the more open, the more generous you are. Once again, our Prophet is going through tough times in order to be compassionate, in order to be merciful. And that is why there are so many ahadith about taking care of orphans. Surely, brothers and sisters, don't you think that 
In all of these ahadith, the Prophet ﷺ is also remembering himself. When he says, أَنَا وَكَافِرُ الْيَتِيمِكَ هَاتَيْنِي فِي الْجَنَّةِ I and the one who takes care of orphans will be like this in Jannah. When he says that, when you see an orphan, say good words to him and put your, hair, put your hand on his hair. There's a hadith like this. Put your hand through his hair, i.e. treat the orphan with love. Don't you think that our Prophet ﷺ is remembering his own childhood as well as an orphan? Our religion has it as a central pillar to take care of the orphan. And our Prophet ﷺ was an orphan. And therefore, as a personal advice to all of you here, it's a little bit of a tangent, Wallahi, the least thing we can do is to find an orphan to help and to sponsor that orphan. Allah has blessed us with so much wealth in this land, with so much that we have here. And our Prophet ﷺ said, I and the one who takes care of an orphan are like this in Jannah. SubhanAllah, don't you want to be like this with the Prophet ﷺ right next to him? And Allah has blessed us with so much. Find out there are so many programs that take care of orphans. And all you need is 30, 40, 50 dollars a month. Wallahi, we spend more on coffee and on our television sets than we do on this. And there are people around the world, there are legitimate organizations that I cooperate with and others are, are, are known to, to be legitimate. That you go and find an orphan in your home country and find out how many I can help. And make it a part of your life that from now on, I'm going to follow exactly what our Prophet ﷺ said. And of course, our Quran as well mentions that taking care of the yatim and preferring the yatim over yourself. And therefore, by going through this traumatic time, our Prophet ﷺ developed that fondness, that softness, that mercy, that tenderness for uh, not just orphans, but all those who are weak. And this is a necessary requirement for being a prophet. Another benefit of this is that this facilitated the Prophet's being raised in the Banu Sa'd so that he could become the most eloquent of the Arabs. And it is well known that the Prophet spoke the best Arabic. And in fact, there is a hadith to this regard as well that Allah has blessed me with the most succinct, the most precise of all speech. Utitu Jawami al Kalim. I have been given the most profound speech. What is Jawami al Kalim? Jawami al Kalim means a small phrase can be explained and understood in hundreds of hours. Little bit of a phrase, and there's much meaning, there's much profundity in it. And so Allah Azza wa Jal chose this for our Prophet for all of these uh, reasons. The final story that we'll mention, we have only uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, the final story that we'll mention is the story, the famous story that we have that our Prophet Sallallahu uh, took a journey to Syria. Now this is a story that we need to give a little bit of academic detail to. Firstly, what is the story in a nutshell? The story which is mentioned in one book of Hadith, Sunan At-Tirmidhi. Realize brothers and sisters, most of the seerah is not mentioned in the books of Hadith. It is mentioned in Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Sa'd, these other books, a different genre. And the standards of those books, generally speaking, are lower. As we explained, and we'll explain a little bit now as well. The standards of authenticity are one degree less. The books of Hadith are the most strict. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nisa'i, Ibn Majah, Mustanah, Ibn Hanbal, Sunan al-Darimi. These are the Ummahat, these are the mother books we call them. Our religion is based upon them. Our theology, our fiqh, our legal, our ethics is based upon these seven, eight, nine books. Muwatta Imam Malik. Around these basically eight or nine books. The books of Sirah are a level beneath this in terms of authenticity. And that is why a lot of the incidents of the Sirah are not as authentic, if you like, as our hadith and our theology. But we have no problems narrating them because... So what if it's slightly weak? It tells us a historical detail. No, no big deal. Sometimes, however, we get into problems, and this story is one of them. So we have to go into a little bit of academic detail. What is the story? It is mentioned that when the Prophet ﷺ was still young, it says he had not yet reached puberty. So we can say 11 or 12. Uh, Abu Talib took him on a journey to Syria. And this, the book, the hadith in Tirmidhi says, along with Abu Bakr and Bilal. And they passed by, on their way to Syria, a monastery where a monk used to live who would never give them the time of day. And his name was Buhayra. This time when they were with the Prophet wasallam, they said that for the first time Buhayra came out searching for them. 
and greeting them and inviting them all back to his house for a feast. And when they told, when they asked him, why are you doing this? He said, you have in your midst a boy, meaning the Prophet ﷺ, who will become a prophet. He said that I saw the clouds shelter him and I saw that the trees uh, also sheltered him and that the stones uh, prostrated to him. And so he told Abu Talib to take care of him. And while they were sitting there uh, eating the feast, they saw seven Roman soldiers, seven Roman soldiers appear. And the soldiers allegedly are trying to find the Prophet who's going to come and capture him and kill him. Buhaira hid them and told the soldiers to basically made an excuse. They went away and then Buhaira told Abu Talib to take him back him immediately to Mecca. So the Prophet was sent back with Abu Bakr and Bilal immediately to Mecca. Now, this is the story in a nutshell. And it is narrated in some basic form in Tirmidhi and of course in Ibn Ishaq and others. And most of the scholars of our tradition have basically accepted it at face value including Tirmidhi, Ibn Hajar, uh, Al-Hakim and others. However, some of our more critically uh, minded scholars, a little bit more uh, 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 verifying and ascertaining, such as Imam al-Zahabi, the famous Imam al-Zahabi, such as Ibn Kathir, the historian. Uh, there's also a famous scholar, Ibn Sayyid al-Nas and others. They said something is wrong about this story. Something is wrong about this story. And of those who critiqued it the most is Imam al-Zahabi. Imam al-Zahabi is one of the greatest chroniclers and historians of the 7th century and he is a student uh, of uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah as well. Imam al-Zahabi, and this by the way shows that he has a critical mind, that, uh, that he's not going to just accept something at face value. And this is the hallmark of an intellectual, of an academic. That you don't just believe everything you hear. Think about it. See, does it make sense or not? In our times, I'll tell you, I'm from academia, as you know, so I study in academia as well. This is a whole genre, if you like, or a whole methodology of uh, modern study, and it is called historical criticism. That you cannot just take the books of history and then take them at face value. Read through, dissect, compare, think. Is it possible or not? Don't just accept anything like this. And this applies to our tradition and to every tradition. And Imam al-Zahabi says, how can this story be true? Abu Bakr was not even, he was just a kid at the time. And why would he go on a caravan with Abu Talib? Abu Bakr is not directly related to the Prophet Why would Abu Talib take him? As for Bilal, he hasn't even been born yet. Bilal has not even been born yet. And he was not acquired by Abu Bakr until after Islam. How did Bilal come into the picture? And then he goes on and he said, why would the trees shelter him when according to the report the clouds are already sheltering him? Why would the trees also then shelter him? And then he said, why don't we find the Prophet ﷺ reminding Abu Talib of this incident when he became a prophet? He said, don't you remember when I was a kid? Didn't Buhaira tell us that I would become a prophet? Why are you rejecting me? Why did the Quraysh find it problematic that he became a prophet? When apparently Buhaira announces to the world that he's going to become a prophet. In fact, why did he himself not understand what was going on when Jibreel came to him in Ghari Hira and he went running to Khadija saying, what happened? I don't know. He should have been waiting for the time. And he told uh, Jibreel, well, how come you're so late? I've been waiting the last 35 years for you. Why is he, why is he himself not... Uh, you know, certain. Why is he confused? Why is he scared? Why is he terrified? He comes to Khadija saying, what happened? I don't understand. Khadija has to take him to Waraqa as we're going to talk about inshallah in a few weeks. And Waraqa has to explain, this is the Jibreel. This is the Namus. This is the, the, the one who comes to, to Musa and to Isa. Why, 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 why? All of these questions abound. Now, question arises, okay, well, maybe there's some, some, some scholars have said, okay, Bilal and Abu Bakr are incorrect details. But then let's accept the rest of the story. Two points here. Firstly, the same story that says Bilal and Abu Bakr also says the rest. So why are you picking and choosing what to take and, and leave? Secondly, and this is the reason why someone like myself, really, I, I have to say this story should not be mentioned except to clarify that it's not authentic. The problem that comes with this story is that most of the non-Muslim historians and researchers have found this missing link that they were looking for in this story. And they said, aha, look, this is where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu acquired all of his information about Jews and Christians. Because you have to realize, 
There was no information about Judaism and Christianity in Mecca. There were no Jews and Christians living in Mecca. There were no libraries in Mecca. There were no Old Testaments and New Testaments. The Arabs did not record the stories of Yusuf and, 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 and Musa and Jesus. It's not relevant to the Ara Arabian culture. Right? The Quraysh have nothing to do with Moses and Jesus and, A and of course not Abraham, but Ishaq. And the Bani Ishaq, the Bani Israel. Correct? Right? This is a lost history for them. And the Prophet comes along, and this is a question that to this day, they don't have a good answer to. He comes along in the middle of a jahili environment, completely uneducated, and he begins reciting the histories of people that were not his own. And there is no university, there is no education, he himself is an illiterate man, there are no books in Mecca, where did he get it from? And Allah mentions this in the Quran. مَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ You didn't choose to recite novels before. You didn't choose to write books before. Where did you get this from? Allah says in the Quran, تِلْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الْغَيْبِ نُوحِيهَا إِلَيْكَ مَا كُنْتَ تَعْلَمُهَا أَنْتَ وَلَا قَوْمُكَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ هَذَا These are the stories you tell to your people. You didn't know this before. Neither you nor your people. مَا كُنْتَ تَعْلَمُهَا You didn't know these stories. لَا أَنْتَ وَلَا قَوْمُكَ Neither you nor your people knew these stories. So, when this Buhayra story comes along, Orientalists, and this is what they do, almost all non-Muslim scholars who study Islam, they say, aha, this is where he must have gotten his information. Now, even if the story is authentic, this is ludicrous. The Prophet is 11 years old, he's barely sitting half an hour, one feast, one, one event, right? How could he got all... So even this we say is ludicrous. Even if the story is true, your theory doesn't make any sense. Will an 11-year-old kid memorize all of this information, encyclopedic information, in a 20-minute conversation, 30-minute conversation, and then regurgitate it 40 years later? It doesn't make sense. But, we don't even have to go that far, because we say, look, even our own scholars, such as the Dhahabi, such as uh, Ibn Sayyid al-Nas and others, they have pointed out that this story doesn't make sense. And Imam al Dhahabi himself said, this story I feel is fabricated. He said, I feel this story is fabricated. And this is something that we need to be very uh, cautious and careful about. That This is a whole uh, other topic uh, altogether, and that is the fabrication of hadith. Unfortunately, throughout our history, people, many of them are sincere-minded, love to just fabricate things about the religion. Why? They have their reasons. Some of them had evil reasons, but many of them had good reasons. So one person fabricated lots of a hadith about Fadail al-Qur'an. There's a very famous fabricated hadith about every single surah has a blessing. The blessing of Baqarah is this. The blessing of Ali Imran is this. The blessing of, uh, of, of Nisa is this. Every surah. And when Imam Ahmad and others finally captured this fabricator, he said, how could you do this? How could you fabricate about the book of Allah? He said, oh, I found the people getting busy in, in fiqh and in, and in uh, uh, books of history. I wanted them to go back to the Qur'an. So I fabricated something. Maybe they read the Qur'an because of it. So he has some... Now, by the way, in those days, they were interested in the books of fiqh. He wants them to go to the Qur'an. Imagine if you know the Muslims of our times, they only go to Bollywood and Hollywood, not even fiqh. Imagine what people would do in our times. The point being, throughout history, there have been people who, for whatever reasons, they have wanted to just... Fabricate. And this is why there's a whole science called the science of hadith. It's a very detailed, it's a very structured science. This was my speciality in my undergraduate in Medina. I studied from the College of Hadith. And it is a four-year program that we had. We went over how do you tell an authentic hadith from an inauthentic one. A, a, a sahih from a da'if from a fabricated. It's a whole specialization. So we have to understand that when it comes to the seerah, a lot of people, they just, because of emotionalism, because of this and that, they wish to just add things that are not found in the earliest books, right? And I already gave an example uh, in the last halaqa, that when the Prophet ﷺ was born, he had his fa finger raised to the sky, that he fell into sajda in front of Allah, this and that. Well, like, you listen to it and it doesn't make sense. And you don't find it in the earliest books, you find it in books written 900 hijrah. How did this guy find out what the Prophet did when he was born? Right? This is fabrication. You have these stories that the Prophet did not have a shadow. Right? You don't find this in Ibn Ishaq. You don't find this in Ibn Sa'd. You find this once again, the people they want to exaggerate. We don't need to exaggerate. Our Prophet is the best human being. And what we know about him is enough to tell us that. When we put these stories in, Wallahi, we give our religion a bad name. 
People look at it and they say, what type of religion is this? What type? We don't need to do this. Allah has told us what we need to know. And in the authentic blessings of our Prophet ﷺ, there is plenty that we can stick to. We don't need to resort to these uh, pseudo-fables and these legends. And it's disservice to us. It will harm our religion and our Prophet ﷺ is not in need of it. So in my opinion and in the opinion of al Dhabi and others, this story about uh, the monk and Buhaira, it doesn't make sense. Logically, it doesn't make sense. Even think about it. If Buhaira had truly said to Abu Talib that this is going to be the prophet of the Arabs, surely Abu Talib would not have found it strange. Surely he wouldn't have told the Prophet ﷺ, why are you preaching this message? Surely the Quraysh, when they would have found out about it, again, it's common sense. It's not something that uh, it makes sense that this occurred. And therefore, Allah knows best. But this story does appear to be uh, weak. Uh, inshallah, with this, it is time for the... Uh, that we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'd like to point out this is the last uh, Sira class uh, before Ramadan. I'll not be in Memphis uh, for most of July. I'll be coming back end of July. We'll have some programs for Ramadan. Inshallah, fiqh of Ramadan, preparing Ramadan before Ramadan, inshallah. And then we will resume... After uh, Ramadan, in Ramadan, inshallah, we have a lot of things planned. Inshallah, we'll have every day, uh, of course, taraweeh and uh, tafsir lecture every single day, inshallah, about the recitation that we've done. Uh, between the, the, the four rakat, we'll have a little bit of tafsir. Uh, inshallah, uh, lots of programs during Ramadan. Uh, of course, there's a grand fundraiser, which we have uh, very, very, alhamdulillah, blessed speakers coming. We have Imam Siraj Wahaj confirmed, alhamdulillah, coming to Memphis. And then we have uh, Sheikh Abdul Karim Adgush, who is uh, the most famous reciter of the Quran in North America. And he won the world competition of Quran recitation in Mecca. He won that competition a few years ago. He became, he's basically one of the top qadis of the world. And he's now living uh, in America. Alhamdulillah, I have a good friendship with him. So I convinced him, Alhamdulillah, to come with us on that same night. We're having a major event on that night. Uh, Imam Siraj Wahaj and Sheikh Abdul Karim Adgush are going to be uh, coming for that evening. Uh, unfortunately, Sheikh Abdul Karim is not going to be for the whole month. I wish, but just for that one night he'll be here. So that's going to be a big event. Uh, as for Sira, we will resume, as we said, after Ramadan. And we're going to talk about the remainder of the pre-prophethood of the Prophet ﷺ, his marriage to Khadija, other incidents that occurred, the rebuilding of the Kaaba, all of this will resume after the month of Ramadan. Bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Any questions that we have before the Adhan? Yes, go ahead. So there's an ayah in the Quran that says, "Woman yu'rid an dhikr Rabbihi, nuqaylahu shaitan fahu lahu qarin." There's an ayah that says that whoever turns away from the remembrance of Allah, then Allah Azza wa Jal will then basically allow a shaitan to become a qarin. This qarin is not the qarin mentioned in the Hadith. This qarin is not the qarin mentioned in the Hadith. And Allah knows best, but this qareen seems to be more evil or more powerful than the other qareen. Because the other qareen, we are supposed to fight him and it is not that difficult to fight him. Seeking refuge in Allah and uh, spitting on the left, saying, A'udhu Billah, these types of things, we can fight that qareen. As for this one, Allah says, those who turn away from my remembrance, then we will basically allow the shaitan to become his qareen. So this type of qareen, it means that when a person has left the remembrance of Allah and the worship of Allah, the angels no longer surround him and his associates around him, his spiritual associates, only become the shayateen. So that is not the same as this hadith in which the Prophet said when the child is born, shaitan assigns a qareen. Qareen literally means a companion. Qareen means a companion. We know that we have angels who are also our uh, companions, Qareens, they, they write, مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْنٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ We know that they're angels that are also recording, uh, and they are shayateen as well. This is Allah Azza wa Jal has assigned and allowed uh, for this to occur. And Allah Allahu Ta'ala alam. Brothers, any questions? Sisters, go ahead. Yeah. Can shaitan cause depression? Shaitan has many tactics that he uses and one of them is 
to cause a type of what you would call depression. Uh, because the purpose of shaitan is to get you away from the worship of Allah. And he uses any means necessary. And one of the things that takes a person away from the worship of Allah is basically to be so mentally uh, engrossed in a problem, in a musibah, that they just sit there and they sulk and they don't do anything. Uh, and there's no question that uh, a lot of these mental diseases, a lot of them, either they are caused by or they are exacerbated, made worse by shaitan. I have no question that this is the case and I firmly believe that even many of the uh, psychological and psychi uh, psychiatric diseases in my humble opinion uh, they are caused by shaitan and that is why people of iman automatically can battle these emotions more than people without iman in other words when you have faith and by the way this isn't just even Islamic faith even for example a Christian Right, who uh, uh, loves his God and what not. Such a person overall is optimistic. They had a survey done, uh, a study done. Generally speaking, religious people are more optimistic than people without religion. Because Allah created us to be religious, right? Generally speaking, religious people have a better outlook on life and they get over calamities and problems better. Now we would say when you're Muslim, even better than this, right? And when you have Iman, even better than this. So all of this, yes indeed, shaitan does use any tactic, any means necessary. And one of them is to have these psychological problems. How can you overcome that? Uh, the same way you overcome religious laxity. The same way you overcome ghafla of the heart. The same way you overcome not having a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First and foremost, increase your ibadah. Doing ibadah automatically links you to Allah. Increase in Quran, increase in dhikr, increase in salah. These are the main actions of ibadah that bring about immediate spiritual satisfaction. Secondly, as well, knowledge. Uh, knowledge as well brings about an understanding of the deen. And that is why, even for example, this knowledge. I mean, this is not me saying this, this is the Quran saying. When you have ilm, your iman goes up. Right? And I am sure that every one of you just by listening to these, these talks, not because I'm giving them, but because it's about our Prophet ﷺ, your iman goes up. Right? So simply having a knowledge of the religion. As well, making sure that you say all of the necessary adhkar to protect yourself from shaitan. When you leave the house, when you enter the house, when you eat food, when you go to sleep, when you wake up, there's a whole routine. And the more you perfect your adhkar, the less if you like, uh, power that shaitan has over you. And our Prophet ﷺ said that dhikr of Allah, remembering Allah is a protected fortress, hisnun hasin, that protects you from shaitan. It's a pr imagine having fortifications and walls and barriers. That's what dhikr of Allah does. When you have dhikr of Allah, you have a hisnun hasin, which is a, a double fortress, is a protected fortress. So all of these things, they help us. Of course, obviously, dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. وَإِمَّا يَنزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغٌ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ That when shaitan throws something into your heart, نَزْغ, this is the نَزْغ. When shaitan throws something into your heart, فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ Seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, by the way, for depression and whatnot, one of, the, one of the simplest cures as well is to hang around righteous Muslims. Not to be alone, not to be sulking, to be in social company of righteous people who will remind you of Allah and bring you closer to Him. And with this, inshallah, we will uh, conclude and open the floor, um, give, make the floor for Adhan. Jazakumullahu khair wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, what is the announcement again? He's going to give a talk? Uh, so tomorrow we have Ustad Nurman Ali Khan coming, mashallah, alhamdulillah, you all know, uh, the from Bayna Institute, and he'll be giving a talk after Maghrib, uh, over here. So tomorrow, tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, so tomorrow after Maghrib, uh, be here as well, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum. Who wants to give the adhan?